The Battle of Colline, June 18th, 1757. Frederick's army is running. The year before, he'd invaded neutral Saxony, forcing its troops into his military and snatching the treasury to fund his war effort. Then he'd struck into Bohemia to besiege Prague, but the Austrians caught him there, causing him to split his forces in order to meet the oncoming army. He had struck at them first, as was his style, utilizing his signature oblique attack, where he concentrated his forces on one side of the enemy line. But his troops had been baited into attacking too early, before they were ideally positioned. His frontal assault had melted under Austrian firepower, an element not emphasized in his tight marching formations, and now, hours later, the Prussians have lost nearly 14,000 men, and they've had enough. Rascals! Frederick strikes out with the flat of his sword, shouting at a retreating unit, Do you want to live forever? It's a strange choice of phrase, because while thousands of troops have died for his ambitions, it's actually Frederick himself that will in fact live forever. Thanks so much to Ground News for supporting today's historical tale. The Third Silesian War would give Frederick some of his most legendary victories on the field of battle, but also his most catastrophic defeats, with Prussia nearly being wiped off the map. But these battles were not just important militarily, mind you. They also formed a sort of proto-nationalism, where civilians at home were following, analyzing, and reading commentaries of his battles almost as they would a sport, but more dramatic. And that fact really got us thinking in the old extra history lab, because unfortunately we don't have time or budget to go through all of his 16 battles, but thanks to my illustrious cat's wonderful suggestion, perhaps we would have the ability to fill you in about it through a different performative art form. Sports entertainment. Okay, extra historians, let's get ready to rumble! Hey there, folks at home. I'm Extra History Narrator Matt. And I'm Casual Wrestling Fan Matt. Sup? And we'll be your commentators for tonight. And you know what a night it is in the EH Arena? You said it, Cash Matt. If you remember last week, Frederick invaded Neutral Saxony, a move so aggressive it spawned a four-on-one match. Prussia against Russia, France, Sweden, and the Habsburgs, leading much of the Holy Roman Empire. You know, you can only hope that this territory grabbing and attacking neutral allies won't serve as some sort of precedent for future German leaders. But wait, oh, dang, there's the bell. All right, opening moves. The Russians have invaded East Prussia. Sweden has entered Pomerania. Oh, big hits. France and Austria are dancing into core Prussian territory too. Huh, looks like a partition of Prussia. Oh my! Frederick has smashed into the French army double his size. 10,000 French casualties to only 1,000 Prussian. Yikes, yeah, they knocked them right out of the ring. Looks like now they're hanging back outside the ropes. But wait, Frederick's dashed over to the Austrians in Silesia now. Again, a force twice his size. Is he jabbing at their left side? Oh, <laughs> sucker punch from the right. Oh, that is a third of Austrian forces gone. Two major victories in one month. That is impressive. But Russia's entered Brandenburg. Looks like Fritz is fighting them off, but... Oh, we were expecting this. Here come the Austrians. Oh, surprise attack. Frederick loses 30% of his army in a strategic blunder. And there is the bell. Time to pause for winner. Indeed, indeed. What do you think so far, Cash Matt? Well, I am. I'm going to tell you, I think it's still too close to call, but Frederick has one huge advantage, in my opinion. Three important words. Unity of command. His enemies have to negotiate strategy and coordinate movements between them, communicating with capitals as far away as Moscow, blah, 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 blah. But if Frederick gets an idea, he just gets to do it, because he is both king and battlefield general, and that is invaluable. Oh, but that's a disadvantage, too. I mean, look at Hokia. A regular general wouldn't have made that mistake. But since he's king, he doesn't have to listen to his generals. Not to mention his experience at Malvitz. Means he keeps fighting when he should really cut his losses. Fair, 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 fair. But you know what? I tell you who he should listen to is his brother, Henry. That kid is a much more careful general overall. And dude's undefeated, right? Frederick's lost like what? Half his battles? Oh, wait, hate to cut you off, Cash. But it looks like Frederick's talking to the fight doctor about how to overdose on opium if things get worse. Can we get a uh, mic down there? Okay, how you feeling, Fritz? Fortune has it in for me. Fate, she is a woman, and I am not in that way inclined. Let's go. Well, all right. Uh, coming out strong in round two, I guess. Whoops, speak of the devil, there's that bell. Man, they are really on him now. Oh, Berlin is open for the taking. Oh, but wait a minute. Russia and Austria seem to be arguing. They're withdrawing? 
Boom. Frederick scores a major hit against Austria. Man, though, these fighters, they look exhausted. I don't know how much longer they're going to be able to keep this up. I mean, Prussia's army is down to like 60,000 men. And like, what, the Russians are in Berlin? Yeah. Well, this might be the end for... Oh, my God. Empress Elizabeth of Russia has just collapsed. And who's that picking up the crown? Wow, that is her nephew, Peter III, a huge Frederick fanboy. I even hear he dresses up as Frederick sometimes. That's weird. Yep, yeah, Peter III's a weird dude, man. Well, he switched sides, withdrawing Russian troops from Berlin and giving back East Prussia. That is a miracle. Frederick's made peace with Sweden as well, and now can focus on Austria. Oh man, what a reversal. I mean, now a Prussian-Russian alliance will do- But wait, oh. here comes Empress Captain with a folding chair. Peter III is supposed, what a slobber knocker. And now she's throwing up the deuces. Russia is out of the war. Wow, what a great move from Catherine. Oh, wow, true that, my friend. I think we're going to be hearing more from her in the future. Now it looks like the ref is bringing out the negotiating table. Oh, yep, yeah, there it is. That is the end. There is the bell. And seven years of war in Europe has ended. Indeed. Tens of thousands dead to affirm that. Check here. Oh, yeah, uh, all the borders go back to where they were before the war. Hmm. Well, that was pointless. Night, folks. Man, I wish I was taught history via wrestling in school. Uh, where were we? Oh, yeah. Prussia survived with its conquests intact, but barely. Plus, Frederick was in no less danger. He'd had six horses shot out from under him during the war, and the years of campaigning had aged him. Shaken by how close he'd come to ruin, Frederick would avoid war for the rest of his reign. And, you know, I kind of hate that we're saying it like that. The rest of his reign. Because Frederick actually did so much domestically. But it is hard to balance that story amid his battles. Frederick's rule was one of centralization. As an enlightened absolutist, he believed a strong monarch was necessary to push forward enlightenment ideals in government policy, with a king as servant and first citizen of the country. He reformed Prussia's legal code to mostly eliminate torture, and repealed most capital offenses so only a handful of executions occurred each year. He opened government positions up to those of lower social ranks, and started an organized grain storage program in order to keep food prices stable and provide bread during famines. Also, as a patron of the arts, he funded philosophers, artists, and musicians, personally composing 121 sonatas and four concertos with the flute. And when Johann Sebastian Bach visited the court, the two actually had a jam session. And all the while, he was still prolifically writing histories, poems, and books on battlefield tactics. He also reformed Prussian agriculture by reclaiming Prussian forests and draining swamplands. And while potatoes were already present in Germany as animal feed, he actually recast them as food fit for human consumption, convincing Prussians that they were valuable by sending royal guards to stand around potato fields. Then in 1772, in one of his most notorious and consequential actions, he managed to avoid a renewed war with the Habsburgs by proposing that Prussia, Austria, and Russia carve up Poland between them, each taking a large piece. Now, there was, of course, no justification for this action, which was against the will of the vast majority of my own ancestors. But in doing so, he did gain the Poland-held province of West Prussia, finally making him the king of Prussia rather than king in Prussia, and uniting his expanded territory. Frederick had no children, for obvious reasons, having spent most of his later life with his personal valet, who had a bedroom next to his. And when he died in 1786, at the age of 74, his kingdom went to his nephew, and his body went into a vault next to his abusive father, even though he specifically requested to be buried at Sanssouci next to his greyhounds. In death, Frederick left an odd legacy, since his contradictory personality meant people could read whatever they wanted into him. German nationalists revered him as a national hero, ignoring that he cared nothing about a wider Germany and despised German language and culture. During the Weimar Republic, Berlin's rising gay culture adopted him as a symbol, and he was also a favorite of Hitler, who justified his expansionism with Frederick's historical example. Though, to be clear, Frederick had zero interest in ethno-nationalism. His reputation fell as a result after World War II, though historians began reappraising him after German reunification, which was when his grave was finally moved to Sanssouci as he wished. But perhaps he received no greater compliment than that from Napoleon himself, who, when he defeated the Fourth Coalition, paid a visit to Frederick's tomb. Gentlemen, he said, if this man was still alive, I would not be here. If that's not a legacy, 
I don't know what is. But actually backing up for a moment, just how interesting is it that so many disparate groups of people found elements of Frederick to latch onto? You know, each taking a little bit of his life that they agreed with and just sort of running with it. Reminds me a little of how headlines from different news outlets today can paint incredibly different pictures from the same news story. You know, if only there was a way to decipher all that. Oh look, how convenient. In case you don't know, Ground News is a really helpful website and app that I use to help me not only get the news I read, but also compare exactly how news stories are being covered across the different news outlets from both around the world and around the political spectrum, which I just find super helpful when I'm trying to figure out what's going on with like conflicting information or sensationalized coverage or seemingly endless social media feeds that I just melt my brain at this point. That way, you know, I'm more confident that I can find the whole story that I'm looking for. And actually, when you do go beyond the individual articles, you get to use things like their bias distribution chart to see all sorts of interesting information about the various media outlets you get your news from. Everything from stuff like factual accuracy, that's important, to political leading, oh heck yeah. And even who actually owns said media outlet. I found that one particularly interesting. All in one easy to read location that helps you not only spot media bias, but just better understand your own personal reading habits. And of course, because biases are kind of like ear holes, you know, everybody's got them. <laughs> Ground News has this other really cool feature feature called a blind spot feed, which basically shows you all the news stories that you probably would be interested in, but that aren't talked about as much at your regular news haunts. Wait, they found a 17 pound meteor in Antarctica? Isn't that how the thing started? Oh boy. Okay, Zoe, you go get the flamethrower and I'm gonna customize my news feed so I don't miss stories like this again. So if you're looking for a better way to stay informed about current events from all over the world, you should go check out Ground News right now by visiting ground.news slash extra credits to download their free app. Then, not only will you have more information about where your news is actually coming from, but you'll also be helping out our channel in the process, which, you know, keeps us in things like flamethrower fuel, which in this particular case is very important. As always, we appreciate your support so much, because as we all know, the news never really stops. Okay, ready Zoe? <coughs> Let's go hunt a sus AF meteor! Leroy! What if I told you that Ahmed Ziad Turk, Angela Valenciana, Arcolite Games, Casey Mustra, Dominic Valenciana, Joseph Blaine, Kuya Koi, and Skylar Holmes were all legendary patrons? I'm not kidding. 